A big thanks goes out to Field Notes. Check them out at fieldnotesbrand.com. Welcome to Pencil vs. Pixel. My name is Caesar, and I have the pleasure of being joined today by Mr. Jim Cadal. Hi, Jim. Welcome to the show. Hey. Hi, Caesar. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you for being, being on the show. Sure. Uh, so now, Jim really needs no introduction, but for those of you who don't know, uh, he is the founder of Cadal Partners, the Deck Ad Network, Jewel Boxing, and Jim is also co-founder of Field Notes with... Uh, our first guest on Pencil vs. Pixel, Mr. Aaron James Draplin. Field notes right here. Um, I love these, by the way. <laughs> so, before we continue, Jim, I wanted to ask you, pencil or pixel? Uh, well, I hate to sort of... Uh, I'm going to say both, because the deck network, the deck, the ad network is completely and totally digital. There is nothing analog about it at all. We are selling inventory on design-focused websites to advertisers, and there's nothing about it at all that is uh, analog. But Field Notes is decidedly and deliciously analog. There's absolutely nothing digital about it. We go pick out the paper. We go to press checks. We worry about how the staples are going in, you know, all of that sort of stuff. So... Uh, for me, that's actually pretty interesting to have uh, one of our main businesses all digital and one all analog. So I'll say pencil and pixel. Awesome. I love it. I love it. <laughs> so, Jim, uh, for, for those that don't know about how you started your career and, and uh, what you do, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Well, what's your what's your story? Um, Kudal Partners was a pretty typical design and advertising consultancy for a long time, but we grew increasingly frustrated with the sort of work for hire model and um, that sort of in many ways forced us to take on business maybe that we didn't really like or do work that we weren't really proud of for people that maybe we didn't like and um, at the same time we were publishing kudal.com and uh, we've been doing that since 2000 since 1999 so we've been doing that for a long time and it generates a pretty good audience and we figured that the people who are coming to that site must be in some way like us so we made a decision about seven or eight years ago that we were going to gradually move our business from doing work for other people to creating products and services of our own so um, we describe Kudal Partners as a typical design and advertising consultancy with no clients so uh, that's sort of how we got here. Along the way, we've done a lot of crazy stuff, layer tennis. Yeah. Uh, we did a, a music uh, firm called the, the Show that ran for a few years. Uh, Jewel Boxing, which you mentioned, which actually we've just shut down. Um, and currently, um, aside from some other things we have cooking, uh, the two main parts of our business are the advertising network and Field Notes brand. So. Can you tell us more about how that transition occurred when you were working with uh, doing client services, but then you decided at a point, uh, as you mentioned, to work on your own projects. How did, did that work out, or was it was it a tough transition? Was it something that um, just sort of morphed into your own personal projects uh, naturally? Um, ne well, it was. We didn't really plan it out very well, but it happened fairly gradually. What what happened was we. I think the first thing we actually started was this jewel boxing thing. And uh, for people who don't know, we had developed a really uh, cool way for a designer to make a short run of uh, CD or DVD packaging. And um, we started that up and it started to make a little money. And so we quit working for a couple of our clients. And then we still had other clients and jewel boxing. And then we started up the the show at that time and that took up more time and generated more revenue so we got rid of other clients and then we started the deck and field notes and by that time we didn't have any time left for client work so we sort of it was not like flipping a switch we started out 
basically with all client work. And then we had a lot of client work and a little of our own work. And eventually we had all our work and no clients. So um, it seems like a really good plan and I'd like to take credit for it, but it sort of seemed to happen more organically than anything else. So, How many people uh, were in your team at the, at the time? Um, we've been bigger and smaller. Right now there's about, there's seven of us that are full time and we have a bunch of people who work hourly and help us pack up field notes and send them out to stores and consumers everywhere. So uh, we've been as big as maybe 15 and uh, we've never been much smaller than this, but it seems like the right sort of size for us. Now, you're, you're based in Chicago. Um, you're, you're, from, from what I understand, you're, you're close with the guys from, now it's a base camp, but it used to be right. 37 Signals. Uh, right. And the folks at Threadless. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just to name a couple. Would you say that being closely connected to, to these creative professionals or these uh, entrepreneurs, if, if you will, yeah. would you say that that, is, that has been influential among among the group over there i uh, i yeah probably i mean i think we all kind of went through the same thing at roughly the same time that uh all three of the firms skinny corp which became threadless and 37 signals which became base camp and kudal partners which became field notes in the deck um we were all when we first met each other we sort of even though we were all geographically close to each other we as as everybody else does we met each other online and um, in fact, we shared offices with 37 Signals for a long time. And um, we were all, we didn't, I guess we didn't really know what was going on at the time, but we were all doing sort of the same thing. We were all at one point doing mostly work for clients and messing around with our own ideas and over time kind of morphed from client services into a more entrepreneurial approach. So yeah, I think it was helpful for us. We're Jake and and Jason and I were so we talked about stuff and you know it wasn't like some overt movement or something it just seemed like we all wanted to take a greater amount of control in the work we were doing you know and when you're working for somebody else you only have so much control no matter how great the relationship is so we wanted to work on things that we wanted to work on and we wanted to reap the benefits of the success and we would go ahead and take the take the the misery of failure too. So, you know, it was fun. Jason talks about, you know, his, his way of planning, you know, they, they, they don't plan too far ahead of time. Do you feel the same way? Do yeah, we're, same? yeah, we're pretty much probably without business plan for 14 years. Yeah. Wow. I mean, we have, you know, now we've got this physical product that involves a lot of, we have to uh, put money out to print these things that we're going to sell. So we have to do some forecasting in terms of financial planning and cash flow, um, which I actually never thought that I would enjoy that sort of thing. But it actually turns out to be sort of uh, an interesting puzzle to unravel. So we do a little bit of that. But in terms of what we're doing next and where we're going to be in five years, I have no idea. So and and, you know, there's a, the advantage in that is that you're open to new things. Like if you've got a rock solid plan, then your whole existence is executing on the plan. If you have no plan, I think in some ways you're more open to uh, serendipity or to accidental sort of opportunities. So um, I'm sure that now we probably all plan more than we planned uh, you know, eight years ago, but still we're pretty free with uh, uh, how we can approach opportunity. Awesome. Now, you mentioned that uh, you're enjoying the operations part of making physical products. I imagine it's a little more difficult, a little more challenging um, because you, 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 uh, you've decided from day one to create these products, field notes. So I'm talking about films uh, in the United States and nowhere else, never, yep. never outsourcing. Right. Is it really a challenge to get the right product, the, the right, you know, for instance, paper, um, and then you come out with different uh, limited edition uh, notebooks? Yeah. Is it, does it really kind of become really challenging when, you, uh, when you're working well, on Well, I mean, the challenge is to come up with the ideas. In terms of executing them, there are hundreds of thousands of great craftsmen in the United States from printers and uh, uh, guys who are uh, growing trees and people who are letterpress. And so we really haven't, I mean, the challenge is that necessarily our input costs are 
higher than somebody who would be printing a competing notebook in, in China or somewhere. But the whole field notes vibe, the whole brand is about made in the USA. There's, it's not, you know, all of our paper goods are made in the USA. We've had some challenges with, uh, you know, pens and pencils and stuff that we have to find other places, and that's challenging. But, um, no, it's part of the thing. We've never considered any alternative, to be perfectly honest. So, you know, that, but that's fun, too. Like, that research part of it, you know, we're, we're sort of a curious bunch. So, like, our latest ones, which I don't know if you have yet, but you should if you don't, no, are man, these. So okay, awesome. so this is the Shelterwood edition. Yeah. And this cover is not printed to look like wood. This cover is wood. It is wood. Yeah, it's a really thin veneer. And... Um, finding a company that could make that and then working with them in order to format it in such a way that would work for a cover of a notebook was a royal pain in the ass, but so much fun. Like, you know, the, the research part of it and solving problems and figuring out how to do it and then how to do it within the context of a pretty structured price um, matrix uh, was all very fun. And it took a lot of time and there was a lot of mistakes and we had to redo things a few times, And but but it's very satisfying to be like the first company that has made an actual wood notebook, you know, like at least at scale. So yeah, those are really, really impressive. You know, I watched the video. I watched the and I love uh, I love your films, by the way. Oh, uh, thanks. You, you really the video explain... is like a, it's like a Sesame Street how they make it <laughs> for printing nerds. You know what I mean? Like it came out really well. It's uh, you can find it at fieldnotesbrand.com. It's yes. linked right off the front page. Uh, and I'll definitely right. have that in the show notes for okay. sure. Do you direct mm -hmm. those films? Um, we do as a group. Uh, one of our guys here named Steve Delahoyd is sort of a uh, copywriter filmmaker. So I would say that he is ultimately the director. Um, I guess I'm the producer. Um, but the ideas come from all over the place. If you look through all the Field Notes films, there's a lot of there's a lot of how it's made, which is what this new one is. But there's also a lot of kind of goofy. Um, um, our idea with the films is to sort of use the Field Notes limited editions as a way to make a film that barely has anything to do with the product. Like in, in some ways, <laughs> sometimes we make the product and we come up with the idea for a film, but other times we have this really great idea for a film, so then we have to come up with a product that fits that. So um, it's a lot of freedom. Um, but we know what we like to watch, you know, like we don't, we have a rule for Field Notes is that when it comes to filmmaking and pretty much anything else is that the rule is no fiction. Like, we can't show a uh, happy grandfather in his uh, Iowa farm workshop writing down his seed allocation for the coming planting season if, in fact, it's not really a happy grandfather in a barn in Ohio writing down his seeding allocation for the next planting season. Like, we don't, people don't play other people. So, in the films for field notes. But, that, but if you think about the brand, it sort of makes sense. And it's also, like most things creatively, constraints are what make you come up with, if you have a, a complete blank page and you can do anything, you you can't do anything. Like So um, that's one of the constraints we've used for Field Notes. So, I mean, that, that's an honest product and we're honest about the product. And I think that's, people relate to that, I think. Yeah, absolutely. They're almost like, they're, they're short documentary films. Yeah, yeah, basically. Yeah. Because you do really explain like where this, you know, for instance, the one, the most current uh, limited edition, how you know, where, you know, everything from the the logging, uh, what is it, plants, you know, right. they, they show the tree trunks and they show how right. the, the process all the way through to the very final product. Right, and some, but sometimes they're not sort of a, a how it's made. Like, for example, we did one last year called Fire Spotter, which was a red edition that was letter pressed and came with a temporary tattoo. And we were sort of obsessed with these um, fire, fire watch towers um, that are all through the United States, but especially in the Midwest. A lot of them were sort of manufactured in the 30s and taken to the spot. So in um, North North Central Wisconsin, we found one. It's no longer in use. There are other ways to check for fires in the forest, and the forests aren't as big as they were in the past as well. But it's still sitting there in the middle of the woods. And so wow. we made a film about that fire tower, but there's no quote unquote documentary thing. It's just basically a love letter to this beautiful steel structure in the middle of the Nicolette National Forest. So 
some when it's an interesting process like the shelter would, then the then the how it's made thing sort of makes sense. But sometimes it's more about the theme of the limited edition and not necessarily about how the actual books themselves were made. So we there is a lot of freedom to do different things, but they they are generally documentaries in one form or another. No, that's very true. Like for uh, I remember watching the uh, the pitch black edition. I love it. It's like a quick commercial. You know. It, it, Everything that's black, like leather and... Rubber, oh, right, right. And, you know, that kind right, of stuff. Right, right. Uh, the one that is sort of related to that one, the one that was the limited edition, was the Night Sky edition. And the Night Sky edition was black and letterpress, but it had um, holographic foil printed on the back. And the field notes generally come in a three-pack. There's one, two, three. And each one had the constellations... Uh, of a different part of the summer sky. So the first one was the early summer, and the second one was the midsummer, and the third one was the late one. And the film for that is completely ridiculous. Uh, that is, we took a camera to the Great Basin National Park in Nevada, and we made a six hour and 20 minute reverse time lapse film of the night sky from sunset until sunrise with the Milky Way moving across it. And, um, that was an excuse to make a film we want to make. The film's great. So if you have six hours and 20 minutes and a 4K monitor, <laughs> you know, it's there, you know, yeah. for you to see. So we also made a shorter version with some real time lapse in yeah. it. But, um, you know, so that that's an interesting one is that the, the actual printing itself of the night sky was uh, relatively uh, innovative. In fact, we were originally going to do glow in the dark stars, but we couldn't find glow in the dark material that was glowy enough for us. It just never really popped in the way we wanted. So we went to this holographic foil imprinting, which is very, really beautiful. And um, so that one's is a really good example of the fact that we were using some innovative production techniques to get a result we wanted, but then to actually promote it, we did this totally over the top crazy six hour film because we wanted to make a totally over the top crazy six hour film so you know so it's part of the experimentation process right yeah 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 and we want to you know we want to learn when we used to work for clients i said this in a number of speeches maybe people have heard it but when when we used to work for clients we used to always ask three questions when we were evaluating whether we wanted to take on a new product uh, and the questions were are, is it going to make us money because we were in business and we needed to pay the rent and pay for our kids' school and all of that. And um, the second question is, when we're done with this thing, are we going to want to show it to people? Are, are we going to be able to do work that we're proud of when we're done with it? And the third question we asked was, um, are we going to learn something new along the way? And so if we could answer yes to all three of those, we were pretty sure that the project was going to be fun. And, and we still sort of apply it to the way that we currently work. Like, we know a lot more about the constellations and about uh, the light from cities and about time-lapse films and about Nevada and the Great Basin National Park than we knew before we ever started that project. And that's a benefit, you know? And we certainly know more about American Cherry and how to make veneer and about Spooner, Wisconsin and other, you know, other things than we did before as well. So the for, each year, maybe I should say that we have a regular lineup of products, but... Um, Four times a year we do a limited edition or a seasonal edition. Mostly, they're almost always limited editions. Sometimes they turn into regular products. But um, And people can subscribe at Field Notes and buy the current one and the next three. So it's like almost like a magazine. And then you, you just pay ahead of time and you make sure you get these limited editions. And so for us, um, we kind of stumbled into that uh, model. But it works on a number of levels for us. One is it's kind of like our own little Kickstarter because people who are subscribing are paying us in advance for a project we're going to do down the line, which helps us with cash flow. It um, allows us to really stretch out creatively because we can do anything. And so we it totally satisfies our curiosity. And then it also builds a really nice relationship between us and our customers directly. The subscribers are our best customers. They look forward to what we're announcing. We keep the new product secret until they're released. And um, so there's a nice dynamic of communication four times a year between the company and um, the Field Notes customers. So it's kind of an interesting thing. But we sell plenty of those limited editions as well as our regular things directly on our site as well as through a network of, I think it's 900 and some stores throughout the world. So, yeah. Wow, and it's all right. kinds of stores. I mean, it's not just a It's group. actually, it's not 
generally speaking, it's not stationary yeah. art stores. It's everything from um, barber shops to surf shops, skateboard shops, um, gun ranges, liquor stores, bait shops. I mean, we're in the places you'd expect us to be. We're in museum stores and we're in a lot of like men's fashion stores where this sort of fits with the current kind of craft focused American made um, fashion and accessories. But we're also in a lot of other crazy stores and not just in the United States, but all over the world. So yeah, definitely. I, I love what I love most about Field Notes is that it's it's timeless. It's, yeah, it's, it looks like it's been around forever. And that's like, sort of yeah. what we wanted to do. Like we, that's the thing. It's like, it's that these things are based in the third, 20s, 30s, and 40s. American agricultural companies were making memo books as promotional items. They were seed companies and fence companies and tractor companies to give to farmers in America. And they would use those to make whatever notes the farmers need to make about their planning or whatever. Um, but it was a really interesting practical advertising medium and in the design is fabulous on a lot of these old sort of uh, agricultural ones in fact there's a film um, on our site called from seed where Aaron our partner Aaron Draplin is our partner in field notes uh, has a huge collection of these uh, vintage ones and he goes through some of them in that film it's worth watching um, and so the field notes vibe is very much of that era and so like people always ask you well aren't you gonna do a field notes iPhone app and we're like no of course not like why would we do that like that doesn't that's not field notes like you know um, so I mean we do use the web to sell them so I guess there is you know we're not we're not out on the road knocking on farmers doors to sell them but uh, <laughs> but yeah it is and part of the fact that it's timeless and American and honest makes it so that it works in a coffee shop in uh, Brooklyn and it works in a bait shop in the UP of Michigan like it's fine in either place it seems completely at home and they're not precious like you don't feel you don't have to write an ode you don't have to write a sonnet to make a note in there you can just write <laughs> milk eggs vodka you know what I mean like it's they're not precious they're easy to use and fill them up and throw them in a drawer and start another one they're, it's a practical thing yeah where do you what do you draw inspiration from what, what inspires you yeah, right. I, well, I think that part of it is to appreciate the craft that goes into things that other people make, whether it is a physical object or a beautiful website or a film or a symphony or a record or a sweater, whatever that other people make, and then to try to tear that down and figure out how how people made it. Well, how did what were the decisions that were made that made this um, um, this record great or this book great and then for us that curiosity sort of kicks in and then when we've taken things apart we start to put it back together in our own way and it's partially trying to uh, make something of a high quality that's the making of it is satisfying to us and it's also partially to learn how to do such a thing like last summer for Field Notes we published a book called The Drive Into The Gap and we um, while we had done plenty of long format um, things in our life, um, the actual process of the binding and the typesetting of the book and the selection of the paper and all of that was really satisfying. And we're a tough customer to ourselves. We're a tough client to ourselves. It's got to be just so. Like we're, you know, and if it's not right, we have no one to blame. Like in the old days, we could say, oh, the client made us do it like that. But now we can't. We are the client. So we have to make it the way we make it. I think I'm inspired by these ideas that I people have ideas. You see them online and you're like that idea where you're like, it was so obvious. Why didn't why didn't I think of that? Like I love to see and then like or a beautiful layout of a poster and then to deconstruct it and try to figure out why the type was chosen just so and how the printing process was. Like th that's sort of inspiration to me. It's like not just the final project but the the process of how someone got from nowhere to somewhere. So I guess. And I'm a, a reader and a film. I go to films and reader, you know, just like everybody else, I find my inspiration in lots yeah, of Yeah, that's what I was going to talk about. It seems, it seems as though, this is my guess, it seems, right. it seems like you're really inspired by music and film. And then you just mentioned reading. But yeah. um, I don't know. I just get that. And you know, architecture, yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. And my three wait, wait, kids. Did yeah. you do you play an instrument? Do you play music? I, I a little bit of the piano. I have, but I don't play much. No. So, no. I, I would. You know, it's all of those things: architecture, and music, and mm-hmm. film. To me, the inspiration comes from com- that how the medium is used to communicate an idea. And so, whether it's through a, a Bob Dylan song or a Mies van der Rohe building or a Stanley Kubrick film. There is some, you know, um, uh, first of all, a, a dedication to craft and to make it as good as it possibly can be. But also there's some idea behind it that is being communicated in a human way, um, I guess. That sounds pretty highfalutin. No, no, no. I love it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it, it completely makes sense. And yeah. you, you, you've chosen some really good examples. <laughs> right, right. Well, I think our, as a firm, our obsession with Kubrick is fairly well known. We've been collecting links about Kubrick forever, and we have a huge page of thousands of links of some interesting, some trivial, and some minutia about his career. I think, the, to me, the single-minded focus to create a thing from start to finish and make sure it's exactly the best thing it can be is um, where I find my inspiration in his work. The Barry Lyndon from the Thackeray novel to the film, the whole process in which he completely controlled the entire process and made untold tens of thousands of decisions uh, that were necessary to bring that final product of fruition is um, amazing and admirable and um, uh, uh, something to be uh, aspired to. So, Earlier in our conversation, you, you've mentioned that there was a point in your career with client services working for other clients when you decided yeah. to stop making things for, for those people. And then you mm-hmm. decided to make things for yourself. Um, how can anyone go from working to from working in client services or working at a job let's say at a company yeah agency yeah how can they go from working there to and and let's say they are really interested in working on this one i for lack of a better term passion project right right how can they eventually or do you recommend that um they eventually transition into that they work on that on the side what would your suggestion be? You know, I, I've said this before, too, is that the problem with working on something in your spare time is that there isn't any. You know, that the, if you're dedicated to your job at a design firm or an agency, it's not 40 hours and go home. And I mean, you know, if you're a craftsman and you, if you're into it and you want to do the best possible work you can in the situation you are, there's no spare time. So you have to find a way around that somehow. And, 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 uh, I don't have, we were in a situation where we controlled our own destiny. We were our bosses. So we had an advantage in that perspective. Um, But the easiest answer to any tough decision is to say, no, I can't do that. Like if you say no to something, then you don't have to change anything. You know, so I think that um, you need to make a positive you have to take action. So if you've got a passion project that you want to work on, you have to figure out a way to take action. And whether that means um, absolutely leaving every Tuesday and Wednesday at five o'clock, no matter what the job counts, so that you can put in five great hours on this in the evening, or whether it is, you know, however you can structure it. Um, otherwise, it's a hobby. And hob- sometimes hobbies turn into businesses too. Um, but in my experience and the people I've known, um, there's something different between an obsession and a hobby. Like it's some, you know, like um, Threadless, for example, when Skinny Corp was working for clients, they started this T-shirt thing and all of a sudden it grew and grew and they were smart enough. Jake and company were smart enough at the moment to say, there's something here, here, like let's roll the dice on this. Let's carve out a percentage of our time to see what we can do with this. You know, In a situation where you're a full-time employee, maybe it's difficult. Maybe the transition to your own project is not 
from your full-time employee situation to your entrepreneurial situation, maybe you need to make a stop halfway along the way. Maybe it is that you go freelance so you can take a limited number of projects to help you pay the mortgage and to put food on the table and to pay back your student loan, but it allows you the flexibility of scheduling that you can put aside a couple days a week to work on this other thing. So, you know, um, when people say, oh, I've got this great idea for this product and I'm going to start it in six months, I think that's really awesome except for the six months part. Like what they're saying is I'm afraid. And so I think you need to, you need to start. And if it fails, that's all right. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, if it goes up in flames, it's going to be interesting too, you know, so, but you got to start. And once you start, then you're going to find that it's difficult to stop. You know, it's, you can't, you can't turn a ship in Harbor. You have to get out on the water before you can turn. So something like that. So. Some folks say, Hey, tell someone you're going to do this thing. And yeah. that'll hold you accountable and it, it, it will allow, or better yet, it will push you to, to, to finish that project. I mean, how, and let's say it fails, it doesn't work. How do you feel about that? How do you feel about that situation? Do you think people should do that maybe, or hold, uh, keep it to yourself? I don't know. I, I don't know. It's a lot easier to say I made this thing than to say I'm going to make this thing. Yeah. You know, like... I don't know, maybe it works, but everybody's different and people find their motivation in different ways. So I'm not, to, I'm not going to say that that's not a, a good way to do it. You know, I think some people use Kickstarter that way is that they have this idea and they put it on Kickstarter. And then if 500 people give them $50, they have to do it now. Like now they're in, you know what I mean? So maybe yeah. there's, maybe there's something, maybe that, that kick is the kick in the ass to get going for some people, you know? So I'm not sure exactly whether I, for me, I think I would rather say, look at this thing I made than, oh boy, I'm going to make this thing. So, but other people will find their motivations in other places. I think. I totally, I'm going to take a step back Okay. into before, before you started your career, did you always want to be a designer? Did you always want to be in this uh, field? I mean, um, I can, I consider you a designer. I mean, you would, you would yeah. say that you do a lot of different things, but yeah. a lot of creative yeah. things. Yeah. I was, I mean, not to start the whole thing. I, in college, I was a art history and English major. And but the formative sort of experience of my college career was editing the newspaper. And so doing the layouts of the college newspaper and, you know, hiring, getting reporters to file their stories and cropping photos and writing headlines and all of that. But then right out of college, I immediately got a job at a TV station. And I was working on scheduling commercials. It was very unglamorous, but it was kind of a cool place to work at yeah. a TV station. But it did let me see a little bit about what this media business was about, including advertising. And I went there from an ad to an ad agency and started as a producer, but over time wound up, was all, I've always been a writer, and wound up as a copywriter and then started doing my own ad designs and layouts and producing my own commercials and eventually became the creative director at the ad agency and then left there to start my own agency and then and then it eventually turned into what it is now so um no i i don't think i would have imagined this path that if you if like somebody once said if you like how did you know at 24 years old that you were going to wind up here i would say with complete honesty is I have no idea you'll have to go back and ask that 24 year old like because I don't you know what I mean like I gravitated towards things that were exciting to me you know and when I first got the agency job and became the creative director I was very excited about the work we were doing high profile work for generous clients and getting a lot of attention and I was getting raises and I you know but eventually it wasn't, it turned out that it wasn't, I thought that would be an end and it wasn't an end at that point. And then finally I decided that maybe I needed to run my own thing. And then, you know, I, you know, it's all like, I think you got to not having a plan allows you to roll with the punches a little bit. So, yeah. so I don't like my career is much like my business. We didn't have a long-term plan. We sort of followed the things that interested us and we're lucky enough that some of those have been able to make money. So I love that. I'm going to talk about any productivity tools that you use, anything you recommend for creative professionals to look into or to use to 
to help them with their with, with a workflow or um, I mean field notes, anything. yeah, field notes, of course, yeah, the field notes steno pan right here. Field note steno pad. That has yes. to be on your table, right? It lays flat. It's open all the time. You write down the phone number. You write down the pixel dimensions of that one image. What else do I have there? A deposit I have to make in the bank. Very sexy. Um, I don't use, I mean, I use what everybody else uses. I have an iPhone. I use notifications. I use a calendar on mm -hmm, iPhone. Mm -hmm. uh, we do use Basecamp here. Uh, and have used high rise in the past. I don't use it very much, where it's used mostly for organizing contacts with uh, stores and distributors and sort of uh, business sort of stuff. Um, I find myself in text editors and Excel pretty much more than anything else these days, as well as obviously uh, Photoshop and layout tools and that sort of stuff. So I don't have any secrets. Uh, I try to keep my inbox pretty empty, and I'm not always good at it, just like everybody else. Um, yeah, so no, I don't. I don't have any anything. To, I don't use any getting things done software or anything like that. So you know what? Sometimes it's better just sort of keeping it simple, right? Yeah, I mean, I mean the field notes. I'm making a joke about field notes, but it's like this pad's always on my table, and the little one I have a, a regular memo book around, yeah. and. Um, I don't know. There's something about writing it down physically as opposed to typing it into the phone that is uh, imprinted on your brain in a more uh, um, permanent sort of way. You know, so I, you know, I'm at the computer all day long, and so I try not to be when I'm at home as much as possible. You know, and I've got three kids that so that's a whole other thing. But um, yeah, I don't I don't have any really good tricks for that. And I'm late for things, and I forget to do things, and that's just the way it is. You know, I, I always write down my notes on on these guys right here. I've, these are my notes from ah. from from these interviews. Actually, let's see. I've got. Let's see if I can identify that. You've got a regular one. You've got a state edition, a pitch black. Oh my gosh! The ones in the middle are those the drink local editions? They Both are. Of them? Both of them. Yeah, those yep. are cool. those are cool covers, aren't they? Oh, those are it's awesome sort of colors. buttery, sort of. Yeah. I love covers. the finish. Those are cool. Yeah, yeah, that's like that was, that was soft, kind of a soft varnish. Yeah, yeah. We'll have to do another one with that cover someday. Yeah, so. I, you know, I, I haven't been able to write on these though, and I know you need why, the right cause use, pen because I yeah. use I usually use this pen. Okay, and that yeah. doesn't dry fast enough. Yeah, so much but, is, yeah. But I still love it for for you know for visual purposes. Yes, and you <laughs> it went to the South Pole with Ben Saunders, so What's that, that was. Cool. They went to the Antarctica. It went to the South Pole with really? Ben Saunders. Yes, yeah, not that one in your hand, but the uh, Expedition Edition did go to the South Pole. So uh, our space pen works very well with that one. Like you, maybe you're not finding yourself in zero Gs very often, or you're not finding yourself at the bottom of the ocean. But if you were, that would be the one you wanted to use. It'll stay yeah. dry. It won't. It, for people who don't know, the Expedition Edition is made out of synthetic paper. Um, which is virtually tear-proof, waterproof, bulletproof. There's, we did a series of tests on the website where we shot it and we bulletproof. dipped it. Well, we used a BB, but, uh, but it still didn't go through. Uh, we used muriatic acid, which was a very exciting day at the office. Um, uh, wind, cold. Um, so it's sort of our, it's the, it's the, tough, the toughest field note. So it's the most durable field notes. Definitely. And, but, but because the synthetic paper has a... Um, closed surface, whereas a regular paper has open pores that soak the ink in. Uh, since this has a closed surface, um, not every pen is perfect for the expedition because if a pen leaves a lot of ink behind and doesn't dry quickly, then it'll be smudged. It'll, it'll smudge easily. So a rollerball pen or a space pen, pencil obviously works great on it. So, but, Nice. So. I think I'm going to grab one of those space pens. All right, guys. do it. Yeah, go like, for the matte. There's two. There's a chrome and a matte black. And the chrome is like the classic space pen from the Fisher Company in Las Vegas. That's the one that went up in the uh, Gemini, you know, spaceship and everything. But the matte black one is pretty sweet. So, uh, Jim, do you have? Is there a book that maybe changed? I wouldn't say changed your life, but had um, helped you out creatively or uh, that has helped you with your career, something that you would recommend for other creative professionals out there? Uh, no, 
I don't think so. Not specifically. I, there are books that I love that were, are very influential to me, but those are, that's more literature and books about the way to see things. Not, I don't have any books that I particularly love about the entrepreneur's dilemma no, 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 no. or I mean, anything like that. About like, yeah. entrepreneurs or designers. Um, well, I mean, um, Julio Cortazar uh, wrote a book called um, uh, Hopscotch in the late 1960s. He's a Latin American writer and a uh, beautiful writer. And um, it is sort of a conceit. It's, the, it's, a sto- it's a story about a guy who is trying to suppress his emotional reaction to the world. And the story can be read as a conventional book from chapters one through chapter 26. Or you can read it in an alternating um, uh, order of chapters, which the author puts at the end of the first chapter, it says go to chapter 24. And you read 24, and at the end of that chapter, it says go to chapter 48. And at the end, it says go to chapter 12. And when you read it in the alternate way, it's a different book altogether. And I know it's sort of a kind of a trick, but the book is so beautifully written that for me, it was a revelation in that the breaking of the form, the form of the novel, the structural form of the novel, um, to to go up against the constraints and break the form of the novel in the way, uh, uh, there's, uh, this is really, nobody's ever asked me about this, but there is, a, there's a, a section in the book where the main character has just broken up with his woman. And he can feel the emotion welling up. And he wants to, Push down. He wants to be a rational, uh, reasonable, practical man. He does not want to be affected by emotion. But this moment has happened to him, and he can feel it rising up in him. So he picks up a travel book, and he starts to read the travel book. And in Hopscotch, at that part of the book, the odd number lines on the page is the travel book that he's reading. And the even number lines on the page is an interior monologue of him reacting to the travel book and the situation that he's just been in with breaking up with this, losing this girl. And it's an, and it seems like that would never work. And it works like, man, it's like, it just completely blew me away. Like, and you're starting to read it. You're like, what's going on here? And once you figure it out, like it's, it's, I, Cortazar is awesome. He did, he wrote another bo- book called uh, the, A Novel Kit. I think it's called 69, a novel kit. And it comes in a box and all the chapters are bound individually. And the idea is that you're supposed to open the box and dump all the chapters on the ground and then pick them up and read them in that order. You're, like you're that, supposed to pick them up and read them in that order? Yeah, you're supposed to just throw all the chapters in a pile on the ground, shuffle them up, pick them up and then read them in whatever order you pick it up in. And it, still and it works. Sense. Yeah, and it, it still, still makes works. sense. And it works. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. So. So um, other influences from a literature standpoint, I'm a big fan of Joseph Conrad. I'm a fan of James Joyce. I'm a fan of Marquez, who recently died. Um, and then uh, Rob, Robert Stone and John Updike and some of John Irving and lots of other books. So, yeah. So I think that the modernist movement in literature that started, you know, whenever that in the 40s, uh, 20s, 30s, and 40s, where the narrator became Henry James, uh, influential. The the narrator became sort of unreliable, and the form of the novel went from the mere telling of a story to an interior or um, unreliable narrator. Like though, those are that's interesting to me. I like when things break form in a way that are that is. Um, but not just as a trick, just also as a way to communicate um, uh, communicate an idea in a truer, more um, individual and accurate way. So I didn't think we we're gonna. I didn't think we we're gonna talk about English literature today. So, or I would have <laughs> thought about it a little before we got here. So I'm trying. I'm trying to get different. You know, different stuff out of you here, Jim. <laughs> yeah. All right. So I would say maybe if you want a short one, there's a no, novel this is good. by no, that was great. there's a novel by Henry James called What Maisie Knew, which is the story. It's kind of a 
pretty typical domestic drama where a couple is having trouble in the relationship, but much of the book is told from through the eyes of their young daughter, Maisie. And obviously what she sees of the relationship is not, and we're only seeing what she sees. So, you know, it's not, he did this, she did that. It's not that sort of thing. And in the same way, Faulkner, William Faulkner is a great example, obviously the sound and the fury and other books, which are told through, um, perspectives, uh, unreliable perspectives or reliable, but individual perspectives that bring their own sort of, uh, thing to it are interesting. So I'm not sure how that relates to field notes or the deck, but it, it does. <laughs> it works. Somehow, yeah, I, I love it. This is great. Yeah. This is great. Jim, before we wrap it up today, I, I wanted to ask you, um, if you have, you've given us tons of advice, by the way, throughout okay. the whole conversation. But before wrapping it up, I wanted to know if there's just one last piece of advice or, or piece of guidance that that you have for, uh, you know, I, I don't like to use the term because it's very general, but for creatives, for creative professionals. Yeah. Let me give you, here's one piece of advice. And this is specifically for visual designers. Okay. Is that if something, you see something, let's say you see a poster that was done in the 30s by a, somebody, a Swiss designer, class one, and it really speaks to you. And you really love the whole thing. And you're not exactly sure why you love it. The most a really beneficial thing to do is to print it out and open Illustrator and remake the poster. Exactly. Start at the beginning and figure out why the lines are that thickness and why the type is set the way it is and actually remake it. Put yourself in the chair of the designer you admire. And when you're completely done with it, throw it out. I mean, when I'm not my, my off the cuff, I'll say the my advice is to rip something off. But you're ripping it off in a way to give yourself an understanding of how it works. It's not necessarily the surface and the finish. It's the structure behind it. Like you can't build a house if you don't know how to drive a nail. You know, like so. Um, find the elements, or if you're a filmmaker and there's a sequence that you really like that some uh, in a film that you can't figure out what it is that you like it, well then reshoot it and cut it or download it to your editing program and recut it yourself. Like put yourself in the chair of the person who made the thing that you so admire and you'll find maybe how they got there and you'll maybe learn something that you can apply to your next project. So there's my advice. Rip something off for yourself. Perfect. That All is right. perfect. Jim, where can people say hi? We're going to find you online. Uh, uh, at kudal.com. And I'm kudal on Twitter, C-O-U-D-A-L. And there's links to field notes and pretty much everything else we talked at at kudal.com. So if you want to drop me a note, send it to jim at kudal.com. So. Awesome. And everyone, you can find what we talked about today in this show um, on pencilversuspixel.com. That's pencilvspixel.com. Slash right. Kudal, and that's uh, C O U D A L, pencil versus pixel dot com forward slash Kudal. Jim, thank you so much for taking the time and being on the show today. My pleasure. We'll see you next week, everyone. <laughs>